Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Apparently, Ripple executive Sandy Young says it's hard to know if the crypto market has actually bottomed or not. Guys, I saw this from XRP Crypto Wolf. In a recent interview, she just did an interview with London-based media outlet The Financial News. Sandy Young, Ripple's managing director in Europe, says that the recent cryptocurrency crash was caused by the unfavorable broader macroeconomic environment. So whereas we have um, guys like Raul Powell saying, you know, he's 70% sure that the market has crashed, Cindy Young says it was it's um, very challenging to predict whether cryptocurrencies have already reached their bottom of the correction due to their increasingly strong correlation with the stock market. She has stressed that the shift in technology is more important than short-term price performance. So... The fact that, um, you know, cryptocurrencies are moving with the technological advancements of cryptocurrencies, this is the thing that is really going to, um, you know, dictate price in the coming years and maybe even coming months. Young has noted that many crypto projects with real world use cases continue to raise funding in spite of overly bearish sentiment. As you today reported, Ripple bucked the trend by announcing that it would continue hiring hundreds of employees globally, despite Coinbase and other key crypto players announcing mass layoffs due to difficult financial conditions. So are we near the bottom or not? Uh, at the time of this recording, XRP is trading at about 35 cents. And guys, if you can see, we did see, uh, recently did see some bullish movement, although we have seen that retract. So XRP was trading up uh, near 37 cents. During the wee hours of the morning, we did see this increase for XRP up nearly 6.5%, but now we're coming right back down um, to where we were trading right before that. One of the other things I should mention here is that the Mt. Gox payouts will begin on August the 28th. So this one coming from Kendra Hill CC here on Twitter. If you guys aren't familiar with the Mount Gox thing, I suggest uh, you look it up. This is an older article uh, just talking about the payouts, but now the time has come. I mean, it's just around the corner. August the 28th is in two days. If you're watching this video on the day that I released it. So creditors of the defunct crypto exchange Mount Gox are getting closer to receiving reimbursements under a plan that became final and binding, bringing one of the longest running sagas in the cryptocurrency world nearer to an end. The timing and specific amount of the repayments haven't been announced yet, according to a letter on uh, Tuesday from Japanese trustee who is in charge of returning the funds to creditors. Uh, investors will have to provide their bank accounts and other information to receive payments. So, Mt. Gox, there was a huge debacle. Um, oh yeah, and as a side note, Jeb McCaleb was one of the founders of Mt. Gox before he got involved in Ripple. He um, he backed away from it, and I believe he sold his share, and uh, some other guys took it over. The repayments could eventually lead to the distribution of more than $8.5 billion dollars in Bitcoin. Now that was the estimated sum back when this article was released back in November of 2021, uh, when Bitcoin did reach its all-time high. Of course, since then, uh, the price of Bitcoin has come down drastically. Um, so Mt. Gox was one of the world's biggest Bitcoin exchanges until it closed in early 2014 after losing the coins of thousands of customers clearly didn't have their cryptocurrency in a cold storage device. Some of the holdings have subsequently been found. Any payout is expected to be a fraction of the original amounts held by creditors after taking into account the lost coins. Nevertheless, we've got to remember the timing of this. 2014, Mt. Gox uh, is still holding coins and is still looking to pay out initial investors in Bitcoin at that time. The trustee held a trove of 141,686 Bitcoins as well as cash and Bitcoin cash coins as of September 2019, according to prior documents. Tokyo-based Mt. Gox suspended all trading and went offline in February of 2014 after losing about 850,000 Bitcoins valued at around uh, $500 million, so only $500 million at that time in 2014. Nevertheless, the coins currently held by the trustee uh, was estimated at $8.5 billion, and again, that was when Bitcoin was trading at about $60,000. So then we got to think to ourselves, when they're returned to their rightful owners, what is going to happen to the market at that point? And since, um, you know, Bitcoin is the leader of the pack, are we going to see a Bitcoin price collapse. I mean, we're already uh, seeing uh, some bearish Bitcoin activity here on the hourly, right now trading at 21,100. Uh, so coming back down. However, we are still in okay shape. We aren't um, making lower lows. We're still trending upward ever so slightly. But once those coins are released, um, I mean, it begs the question, is this when we're going to see that move to the downside? That move that for all intents and purposes, 
could bring uh, Bitcoin and, uh, by extension, the rest of the crypto market down even further, down to that 80% correction mark that, uh, you know, we, we've seen this in other bear markets, um, bringing the price of Bitcoin down, hitting this level of resistance. Old resistance would form new support. And uh, again, I'm just theorizing here, guys. That would make Bitcoin about $13,700 or $13,800 roughly per coin. My thinking is that the Bitcoin has been held up since 2014. All these investors are clamoring to get their hands on that Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, they've become really, really rich off the Bitcoin. So the theory goes as such, they get the Bitcoin, they sell the Bitcoin, dump it onto the market. There's more supply of Bitcoin in the market. Price goes down. Conversely, it may be that, you know, they haven't had this Bitcoin for all these years and maybe their, you know, plans are uh, sell some of it make some money off it, but keep holding it and let that price accumulate even further. So there's a case for dumping all the Bitcoin, which would be negative for price, but there's also a case for selling some of the Bitcoin and holding some of the Bitcoin. So we may get one or the other or something in between. And I mean, you know, this isn't unheard of in past bear markets. We have seen Bitcoin go down that far. In 2018, we saw Bitcoin go down as far as 84%, give or take. And if you guys remember, we were all fine and good for months. Um, you know, just kind of vacillating in this area of uh, 70, or sorry, $65,000, 63, 64, 6,500, so, excuse me, $100, not $1,000, before Bitcoin jumped off this cliff, down another 50% to $3,000 per coin. So I'm wondering what's going to happen with uh, Bitcoin price. Cindy Young also not sure. She's saying, you know, it's going to be based on the tech. The good news for XRP holders is that the tech keeps improving, guys. PondFi official just announced a new partnership with the Flare Networks, and the Flare Networks built on the XRP ledger. So PondFi will ally with Flare to boost interoperability and engage broader scope of non-standard assets beyond just NFTs and LP tokens for various chains to power seamless Web3 interaction. And so their official blog uh, is up here. If you guys are interested in reading this, I'll just read you guys a little bit here. The industry is moving towards one that multiple chains coexist in a growing blockchain space. What comes with it is communication between different chains. Otherwise, the users will be refrained from enjoying advantages from incompatible ecosystems. So their big focus, interoperability, and this has been uh, Ripple's big focus too since the beginning. Under the collaboration with Flare, PondFi will further support a more diversified range of non-standard assets, more than just NFTs and LP tokens, and develop new financial functionalities and yield protocols. Being a liquidity portal for digital assets, PondFi focuses on expanding its ecosystem scope and has integrated integrated popular chains such as Ethereum, BNB Chain, and Polygon to confront the e-liquidity issues of NSAs. This is also where PondFi meets Flare, as Flare aims uh, to bridge L1 chains to promote free flow of assets. The common pursuit of interoperability has strengthened PondFi's ability to tackle thorny problems like separate operations in standalone ecosystems and costly gas fees. So we're seeing this partnership, PondFi and Flare, building towards interoperability. Uh, so interesting news there. Also want to to uh, take a look at this guy's from the Wrath of Kahneman, Miguel Viaz. Okay, he was one of uh, uh, Ripple's former employees. He has moved on since he uh, first moved to Link 2 as a COO, but then moved jobs again. This time he is at Forte Labs, which is another company, a uh, gaming company that is also partnered with Ripple. Miguel Viaz is the VP of Growth at Forte Labs, the blockchain based video game platform. Most recently, he was the COO at Link 2, as I'd mentioned, a fintech startup focusing on uh, democratizing access to venture backed company equity and before that he was the head of xrp markets at ripple one of the most prominent cryptocurrency companies in the space at ripple miguel managed the team responsible for developing the market ecosystem around xrp which at one point was the second largest digital currency in the world before focusing on cryptocurrencies and startups he held uh, leadership positions at uh, the cme where he managed precious metals futures and options products so he has a background in finance here uh worked at other uh companies like bank of america and morgan stanley so well-versed was one of the guys responsible in growing XRP and developing the market ecosystem around XRP. So now he's uh, working in growth at Forte Labs. I wonder if they are uh, looking to ramp up XRP utility as well. Just reading into some of the potential clues of this hire, you know, considering Viaz was responsible for specifically uh, developing the XRP ecosystem within the context of Ripple, now moving to Forte Labs and he is the VP of growth. So a little bit of speculation. So some interesting news there. Wanted to thank the Wrath of Con a minute for posting that and guys digital asset buy here posting this forbes apparently took down the article that rosalind layton posted 
the Gary Gensler Resign article. Now, we, the XRP community, was making waves, getting the word out there, Gary Gensler, you should resign, and Forbes apparently took down the article. But then I ended up doing a Google search, and I happened to find it. So maybe they were just doing some uh, maintenance on the website or whatever. Gary Gensler resigned, guys. Here is the article here, and it was just posted yesterday, August the 25th. So this Forbes article here, uh, very uh, critical of Gary Gensler for uh, obvious reasons, I think. They mentioned the Ripple uh, SEC case. Um, of course, welcome to the party. It's, it goes on to say, the SEC's pattern of regulation by enforcement has obliterated the hope of U.S. leadership in financial innovation in cryptocurrency and opportunities for new investors. The SEC's two-year litigation against Ripple has spooked innovators and discredited the agency in the eyes of consumers and investors, whom by law it is supposed to protect. The SEC's increasingly stupefying arguments about Ripple's digital asset XRP have departed even the broad discretion allowed by the 1933 Securities Act or the Supreme Court's 1946 Howey decision. So, Forbes getting on board here, backing XRP holders, uh, you know, looking at the situation, realizing Gary Gensler, you too have to resign is interesting because I also saw this, uh, this video clip here from XRP Lank. This is a clip of Carolyn Wilkins. Okay. Uh, she's an external member of the financial policy committee for the bank of England, but she's also, uh, had some experience too working with the bank of Canada. Okay. Uh, Carolyn Wilkins is a Canadian economist. She served as a senior deputy governor for the bank of Canada from May 2nd, 2014 to December 9th, 2020. Wilkins was the first woman to hold a position of senior deputy governor, the highest position ever held by a woman at the Bank of Canada. And now she's got a position at the Bank of England, uh, similar to Mark Carney, who was the uh, the head of the Bank of Canada at one point and then moved on to be the lead guy over there at the Bank of England. So are we seeing a pattern here? I don't know if Carolyn Wilkins also has uh, connections to the World Economic Forum, like Mark Carney does. Nevertheless, you know, she was asked about whether she thought XRP was a security or not. But it didn't look like she wanted to give an opinion. XRP Lank down here saying, keep your eyes on her. I'm going to play you guys this clip. Uh, also in this clip is Dan Moorhead talking about XRP as well. Listen to this. Um, the, 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 uh, the question about uh, Ripple and XRP, would you be willing to uh, comment on whether XRP becomes security or not? I, I don't, I think, what do you think? I, I don't think I should comment on that. I'm happy to. So um, it's an interesting one. Uh, I was at a conference with the CEO of Ripple. Um, we've been investors there since 2013. And the panelists asked him a question I didn't even know was true. He said that 19 out of the top 20 protocols are now based outside the United States. And he's number 20 and he's in a lawsuit with the SEC. He's probably going to move to Singapore. So as an American citizen, I think it's terrible that the government is scaring productive companies out of our country and to elsewhere. And it's the opposite of the Internet, right? The U.S. government literally built ARPANET and then gave uh, sales tax subsidies to Amazon to help them grow and, you know, gave all kinds of indemnifications to make the Internet happen in the United States. And I think as a citizen, we've gotten a lot of benefit of having all the major Internet companies here. And I think it'd be unfortunate if the SEC and others scared, you know, blockchain to other countries. Yeah. Uh, but the punchline is, I don't know. It's a federal court case. And in about six months, the judge is going to tell us. In about six months, the judge is going to tell us now, uh, this clip, if I'm not mistaken, was posted uh, in May of 2022. So six months from there brings us to November of 2022. And I think uh, Dan Moorhead just got lucky on the timing um, because November would also bring us coincidentally to the implementation of the ISO 20022 protocol. Don't know if the judge is going to necessarily make the distinction and, uh, you know, give XRP clarity to coincide with that because it's convenient for the world of finance or if this is going to go into 2023. Of course, if there is a settlement, um, we may see favorable terms and it might get settled sooner. So we're all just keeping our eyes on this, paying attention to the details. Carolyn Wilkins not really wanting to speak out on this, uh, but Dan Moorhead, you know, as he said, has been invested in Ripple the company and I believe these guys own XRP too and have been since 
since 2013. And uh, you heard that statistic right out of the top 20 fintechs. Ripple is number 20, and uh, they are in court with the SEC, which is obviously problematic for global adoption of XRP, the United States being the biggest economy in the world, at least as of now. And so could this be subverted? Will another country take charge? And will blockchain and cryptocurrency be in the forefront of some other country's economy? All interesting questions, and I know a lot of uh, you know economists in the U.S. are saying this could be a huge mistake if uh, the SEC doesn't give cryptocurrency the clarity. Like we know, though, the entire economic system, the financial system, is looking to collapse at the hands of global elites. So there are so many moving parts here. It's kind of difficult to get through to wrap your head around in one cohesive thought. Anyway, thought I'd just bring you guys this clip. Also wanted to mention this, guys, from Bull Run Wonka here on Twitter, Super Lawyer John Deaton fights for XRP holders. Here is his latest appearance on Fox Business News. Now, I'm starting this clip about two minutes in. Um, the first two minutes was just a bit of a preamble, and I didn't want to make this too long. So here's John Deaton talking to Charlie Gasparino, the latest on his part, defending XRP holders specifically against the SEC. Listen to this. And I think the last time you were on the show, uh, the SEC was trying to get you thrown off the case. <laughs> they don't like you. So wh wh where does that sit? Yes. Well, thank you for having me, Lauren. Thank you for meeting you. Uh, good to meet you. Listen, 72,500 people from over 142 countries around the world have joined together. These are the people that Gary Gensler swore to protect. And instead of talking to us and reaching out to us, he filed a motion, his SEC lawyers filed a motion to revoke our standing in court, which means revoke our amica status, and personally had me thrown off the court, so out of the case. You, you well, the judge home? ignored their silly uh, request. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm still allowed to participate. But you want to know who Gary Gensler does have time for? He's met Vanguard seven times since being SEC chair. Why is that relevant? Because Vanguard manages 90% of his 121, 120 million fortune. So he can meet them, but not us. Who's he protecting? It, that's, it's a, it's a good quote. We, tri we tried to get him on. By the way, before he issued the op-ed to the Wall Street Journal, we were going to, we were asked him to do the op-ed. I guess he said, screw you, and I'll just do it in the Wall Street Journal. That, be that as it may, but we'll give you the floor. Um, why doesn't he have standing to do what he's doing? He claims that all these things are sold, so they're securities. And once it's, it's a rotten piece of fruit, it does extend to the people that holds them. And, you know, if you got, if, if, if XRP is a security because of the way Ripple issued it to finance its platform, just like you would issue a stock or a bond, they did not register with the SEC that, that XRP, that XRP is in circulation illegally, allegedly, and then you pick it up and 72,000 people pick it up, but you, you still, you're, you're holding a, an illegal security. Why is why is that? Why because is, what's the, wrong with that analysis? Because, because that's the, what I think he's saying. Because in the Howey case you referred, they said that the sales contract and the service contract and the scheme is the investment contract. That's the oh. security, not the underlying asset. The oranges or the land track, which, orange which groves. Howey was about selling right. orange groves, right? And whether that instituted a, con, a, a contract. And, the oranges and were never the securities. The underlying asset is right. not. XRP is digital code. It, that's all it is, an alphanumeric code. It's so, software. So what you're essentially saying is Ripple is guilty, not the XRP holders. Or what Ripple I'm, could be guilty. Well, what I'm saying is that in 76 years, when you look at all the SEC right. cases coming from the Howey case, there's never been a case where there's been absolutely no privity between the purchaser and the buyer. Right. What I'm saying is, SEC, if you can prove the case against Ripple, right. go out, go at it. Right. Do your job. But when you say that a person who purchased it on Coinbase, who's never heard of the company Ripple, and has no idea who Brad Garlinghouse is, when you're claiming that that token 10 years later is an unregistered security with Ripple, now you've stretched that Howey case beyond recognition. It's like saying all the oranges in the groves that were illegal contracts, the oranges are illegal. It's like saying a grocer, imagine a grocer is like a digital exchange, like a right. Coinbase. When you go in and buy the orange, they're saying you now hold an unregistered security. Even though the grove that produced the orange may be illegal. And if that person sold it. So right. here's the thing to understand. Bitcoin has been used as an unregistered security. Doesn't make Bitcoin an unregistered security. Chinchillas, whiskey, oranges, beavers, all of them have been beavers. held. Yes, beavers. Like there was house. a it's the scheme of oh, how you okay, use gotcha, it. Gotcha. Condos <laughs> have been used as no, any commodity. I'm getting the rap here, John, but I want to so, just real quick, Phyllis, and where's the case stand? Where's it going? 
Well, the thing to know is that Gensler's request to have me thrown off, that's not going anywhere. We're still participating. Is it going to court? It's going to court. There's been summary judgment filings that are happening. There's experts Will that are being challenged. Will it get done by the end of the year? No. It's not going to get done. Unless right. there's a settlement, it won't so, be done. So we're going to get you back on soon, I guess. I hope so. <laughs> back to you. Till then, John, Charlie, thank you. Well, there you have it, John Deaton thinking it might go into 2023 unless we see that settlement occur. Very good explanation to reiterate where he stands, how he's supporting and defending us XRP holders, and why XRP is a commodity, a currency, but certainly not a security. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.